Now you tell me what the Pentagon and the Department of Defense bring to the table when it comes to countering the BRI. Hi guys, hello and welcome to another video. Thank you so much to all those of you who make sure to be subscribed to my channel. I saw the numbers jump up and that is pretty good. Make sure if you haven't seen yesterday's video to ensure that you still subscribe to this channel because it does make an effect. So thank you for that. Now, in my last video, I expressed my concerns for the US plans to counter BRI projects by using the Pentagon and the Department of Defense. And I, and I actually think that many people don't really understand the significance of such a threat. So in today's video, I want to present some facts about China's importance, China's relevance for the development of the global south and what I think is really at stake when development projects become the targets of US military might. So let us begin by talking about some important facts. Let's talk about China's manufacturing dominance. It is just unmatched. It holds 35% of global manufacturing share. When you think about that, all G7 countries combined cannot even reach this level. The US trails far behind at 12%. Now, while the US is the world's sole military superpower, it has to spend more on its military than the 10 next highest spending countries combined. China, on the other hand, is now the world's sole manufacturing superpower. Its uh, production exceeds that of the nine next largest manufacturers combined. China also leads in something called value creation. There is an indicator that is measured via trading value added or TIVA, which basically considers the value that is added by each country in the production of goods and services that are consumed around the world. China holds 29% of the world's total TIVA with the US lagging behind with 16% and the rest of the G7 with 17%. In addition, China boasts a very strong domestic supply chain, while at the same time, Westerners uh, are heavily reliant on China for intermediate goods. So even if the U.S. wanted to reshore some of its manufacturing, they would still have to continue their trade with China as their imports of intermediate goods from China. These are the goods that are needed for the production of final goods. This type of imports has increased dramatically because China has built a very solid and outstanding industrial supply chain here at home. China has also achieved an absolute monopoly of certain sensitive sectors like the refining and the supply of rare earth metals with a 95% control of the global supply. So, in short, what this all means is that from the early 2000s until 2022, the US has now become three times more reliant on China than China is on the US as a source of industrial inputs. So America may restore some manufacturing, but decoupling as such, that is nearly impossible. And the US is but one example of this. Take a look at December 2023, when it was reported that Korea had suffered a first trade deficit with China in the last 31 years. Korea's exports to China totaled 114 billion in the first 11 months of 2023, but the imports amounted to 132 billion. How did that happen? Well, because China no longer needs to import a large number of industrial and technological components from South Korea. Guess why? Because they're now produced domestically. China also plans to become the top manufacturer in high-tech areas by the year 2030. We are talking about areas such as aerospace, uh, equipment, uh, aircrafts, high-end CNC machines, robots, engineering machinery, uh, biomedicine industries, that sort of thing. The thing is that scaling up these industries is going to be possible for China because 
He plans to expand its commercial ties with developing nations who will welcome and who will profit from incorporating these technologies into their own economies. For decades, developing countries in Asia and Africa have faced a very harsh reality. They've been stuck supplying cheap raw materials, the, the building blocks of industry, to the developed world. These raw materials, as you all know, are then transformed into finished products and sold back at a much higher price. This cycle leaves these developing nations with very little to show for their resources. These countries lack infrastructure, they lack the skilled workforce and the industries that are needed to truly prosper. Which is why, across Africa and Latin America, nations are demanding more. They're saying, enough of this. We need the tools to build our own futures. We need construction machinery to improve our infrastructure. We need cutting-edge telecommunication networks to connect our people. And we need reliable power generation to fuel our own growth. We need to develop the skills of our people that are needed to compete in the global market. Take, for example, Zimbabwe. In 2023, they stop exporting raw lithium, plain and simple, point blank. They are no longer content with simply handing over their resources. They are now demanding partners who will help them build a domestic lithium battery industry, which is, of course, as you know, a key component of the modern world. And China is stepping up to be a partner in this transformation. I would at least, you know, like to see Africa, the Africa-China trade relations, um, you know, being diversified from not just your 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 your, your commodities or raw commodities. Um, I think we would like to see a lot more value addition being done in Africa. I think we'd like to see more of value added products from Africa finding markets in China. And I think the more robust the trade becomes, um, the more sustainable the relationship you know, will be going forward. They have the technology, they have the expertise to equip developing nations with the industrial tools that they need. Look at Ethiopia, for example. With China's assistance, they're building massive industrial parks. These parks are, are designed to manufacture everything from textiles, leatherware to cars. Yes, affordable Chinese cars. That is, cars that are specifically designed for the Ethiopian and the African markets. Because this is all about creating jobs, boosting economies, and empowering nations to take control of their own destinies. It is well known that China is already a leader in construction, in high-speed and conventional rail, as well as all other related infrastructures in this business. So, the construction of tunnels, the construction of bridges, etc. Now, in terms of energy sectors, China is also the world leader in hydropower construction. In addition, they lead both manufacturing and implementation of solar and wind energy production technologies. Now, this is new to me. China has also started commercializing domestically developed third generation nuclear power plants. So, it is easy to see how China is actually perfectly suited to embark on this modernization and this lifting up of the global south, something that had very, very long been denied to them by Western powers. For developing countries, China now offers a path to progress without need for ideological constraints. These countries can access machinery and technology through Belt and Road Initiative. They can focus on areas that are critical to their development like infrastructure or healthcare. Now, unlike the West, China is willing to share these tools for mutual benefit. This shift in the nature of these partnerships could really reshape the global economic landscape. If you remember a video that I made a, a few years ago, I mentioned that Xinjiang, in my opinion, represents the future of China. 
you can watch that video over here once we finish here. <laughs> China's new um, West strategy is positioning Xinjiang as the launching pad for this strategy. Xinjiang is quickly becoming a trade and industrial hub that is connecting China to Central Asia, West Asia, and even Europe. There's a reason why Western NGOs that are funded by these three-letter agencies are so hell-bent on disrupting its development. The truth is that billions of billions of dollars are pouring into infrastructure and logistics projects in Xinjiang to support this vision. Now, the most significant transportation infrastructure projects that are on their way as we speak are the china kyrgyzstan uzbekistan Highway and the china kyrgyzstan uzbekistan Highway, as well as the second phase of the china tajikistan Highway. Now, to give you a better idea of the importance of these transportation networks, you can simply look at the trade between China and the Central Asian nations. In 2023 alone, that reached $90 billion, which represents an increase of 27% year on year. And, and this will only continue to increase. With regards, for example, to the China EU Express Rail, the CEER, China and Kazakhstan have plans to enhance the capacity and add new routes, such as the Middle Corridor, this is known the, as the Trans-Caspian International Transport Corridor. This is going to link China to the Black Sea from Kazakhstan Caspian Seaport of Aktu and to Azerbaijan, Georgia, and also a branch that will lead to Turkey. China's vision of the VRI is just amazing, but it also goes beyond Central Asia. The Middle East and Africa regions are areas that are rich in resources. Importantly for China, they have a young population and they enjoy strategic locations. Both of these regions hold an enormous economic potential for the world. And with China as a partner, they are now on a much better path towards development than in the past 40 years of geopolitical proxy wars. These decades of wars and exploitation by Western forces, mainly the US, and its security concerns in the Middle East seem to have created a, an economic void that China is now eager to fill. Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other countries are now joining forces with China through BRICS Plus and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which further solidifies this new economic landscape that is being created. It's, it's a proposal that allow these countries to break away from their single export paradigm. Oil prices will no longer determine their fate as much as it used to. And, and the fact is that throughout all these developments that I've been talking about, this redrawing of very large pieces of the world economy, Xinjiang remains a central player. Xinjiang is positioned to be a crucial link in China's westward economic endeavors. So finally, finally, economic interests, not military might, are going to become the driving force for foreign policy in this region and around the globe as well. China's geonomics, its strategy of cooperation and infrastructure development is ushering the global south and the developing world at the gates of progress and prosperity like they have never experienced before. The future for them is no longer about simply being a resource provider. The future for them is about becoming industrial powerhouses themselves. Now you tell me what the Pentagon and the Department of Defense bring to the table when it comes to countering the BRI. I don't understand it. All right, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now. Do remember, if you want to support the work that I do, there's a link in the description down below and a QR code on the screen if you use WeChat. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.